As late as the end of the 1940s, public buildings in the main boulevard civic arena deferred to the consensus style of civic design and unifying architecture formulated in the 1920s. Baylor College of Medicine, this is the original building here, of 1948, the first building completed in the newly established Texas Medical Center adjacent to Herman Hospital, projected symmetry, centrality, and frontality to reciprocally shape public space. Its tile roof constructed continuity with the main boulevard Mediterranean civic style. At Rice in the post-World War II years, the integrated vision of Ralph Adams Cram was rejected as old-fashioned, but it was not replaced with the new vision. The Fondren Library of 1949 and Anderson Hall of 1947, designed as a group by the Houston architects Staub and Rather, broke with the general plan by citing the library at the faculty's insistence in what was to have been Cram's Great Square. Architecturally, the buildings were ambivalent. They rejected Cram's Byzantine discourse, but their stylistic substitute sought to be merely inoffensive. J.T. Rather's design of the Abercrombie Engineering Laboratory of 1948 was more respectful of the spatiality of the Court of Engineering uh, next to the mechanical laboratory. It radically simplified the complex layers that Cram, Goodhue, and Ferguson so carefully built into their architecture and landscape in its streamlined horizontality. Uh, however, the building does include uh, the relief sculpture Energy uh, by the sculptor William M. McVeigh, uh, a Rice alumnus. In the 1950s, Two sets of buildings constructed what was then a radical proposition <clears throat> that modern architecture could extend the principles of the general plan by inventing modern analogs to Cram's architecture. Jones College of 1957 by the Houston architects and Rice alumni Herman Lloyd and W.B. Morgan persuasively demonstrated this proposition. It was the first building complex of a new residential quadrangle for women. In their use of long, thin, slab buildings that shaped space, much as Cram's had, their imaginative use of Georgia pink Etowa marble in a modern curtain wall, and in their clever modernist analogies to cloisters, Lloyd and Morgan reinvigorated the architectural precepts of the general plan without trying to reproduce Cram's style. The Houston architects George Pierce, Abel B. Pierce, and their designer, E.J. Goodwin, again all Rice alumni, did the same thing with their Earth Sciences Group and Hammond Hall of 1958. The Pierces and Goodwin repeated Cram's slab building typology, inframed quadrangular spaces between the buildings, and constructed vistas of defined movement that reinterpreted Cram in a modern way. In comparison, Wilson Morris Crane and Anderson's college editions of 1957 seem constrained by their more literal tribute to Cram's original dormitories, although they benefit from William McVeigh's humorous terracotta relief plaques. Rice's modern buildings of the 1950s also have a historic context. Many of their architectural attributes are reflected in the two most significant university campuses built in Texas in the 1950s. At Trinity University in San Antonio, uh, built originally from 1950 to 1955, the San Antonio architects O'Neill Ford and Bartlett Koch, with Sam Zisman, William W. Worcester, and Arthur Berger, disposed long, thin, slab-shaped buildings in rows on a heavily planted site. Typical of modernist architectural practices of the early 1950s, Ford and his associates avoided ornament, historical quotation, and symmetry, even to the extent of clustering live oaks in grove-like formations rather than lining them up in alleys. At the University of St. Thomas in Houston of 1956 to 1959, the New York architect Philip Johnson aligned simply organized modern buildings along a gallery walkway, 
which, mindful of the university's Catholic affiliation, uh, he referred to as cloisters. Johnson subtly layered space on the small three-block campus in a series of planted courtyards between and within his three original buildings. In this historic context, what makes Rice's modernist buildings of the 1950s notable is that they employed modernist strategies to construct continuity with Cram's buildings and spaces. In the late 1960s, the firm of Lloyd, Morgan and Jones made a radical counter-proposal with their design of Sewell Hall, completed in 1971. At the request of the building's donor, Cram's client, Blanche Harding Sewell, they based the design of Sewell Hall very literally on that of the physics building in order to complete Cram's vision of the academic court. Ten years later, a more complex approach was ventured with a small building addition and remodeling that turned Rice's campus architecture around. In 1979, the London architects James Sterling, Michael Wilford and Associates were commissioned to remodel and expand Anderson Hall to become the home of the School of Architecture. Adhering to the postmodernist practice of contextualism, Sterling and Wilford, uh, Michael Wilford had taught at Rice as a visiting critic and knew the campus, cleverly echoed certain historical details in their additions. Uh, the only way that they changed the academic court front of the building was to insert a conical skylight, but in its proportions and shape, it of course mirrors the uh, Venetian Gothic pinnacles of uh, uh, the physics building as well as Sewell Hall. <coughs> But more fundamental was their recovery of the spatial order of the general plan, apparent in the way that their new wing, uh, here you see the back wing of the building on the left, uh, reflects the back of the physics building, which you see on the right, and the way that Sterling and Wilford learned from Cram to project space by aligning openings to frame vistas. Herring Hall of 1984 by the New Haven architect Cesar Pelli carried this postmodern contextualist attitude further by demonstrating that new buildings could compensate for planning mistakes of the past by recovering the integrity of the general plan. <clears throat> Herring, is bold, uh, Herring Hall is bold and iconoclastic architecturally, but Pelly was very attuned to the spatial implications of the general plan. Herring Hall's slab shapes repeat those of the Cram buildings. Its entries align with long cross axes that penetrate the Earth Sciences Group and the Rice Memorial Center. Its courtyard mirrors the dimensions and locations of the RMC courtyard in an effort to restore coherence, not by dismissing buildings such as the Rice Memorial Center, which disrupted that coherence, but pulling them back into a new spatial order. Cesar Pelli's architecture struck a responsive chord in Houston. Ben Taub General Hospital in the Texas Medical Center of 1990, designed by the Houston architects CRS Seren, uh, two of whose partners had served as head of Rice's architecture school, and the Shepherd Square Shopping Center of 1990 by Watkins Carter Hamilton are only uh, two of the more prominent homages to Herring Hall. Cram's architecture at Rice stimulated the imaginations of Pelly and his associates. It led Pelly to explore new ways to express the condition of veneered construction typical of the second half of the 20th century, the fact that the brick and stone wall surface is simply hung on an underlying steel frame rather than being a load-bearing masonry structure. Pelly constructed continuity not through imitation but through a process of extrapolation. In turn, Pelly's architecture at Rice provided a model for Houston architects as they too sought to overcome the architectural limitations of veneered frame construction. During the 1990s, Rice's architecture vacillated. While continuity with tradition was and remains the official policy, Architects are allowed wide latitude in interpreting what constitutes tradition and continuity. 
George R. Brown Hall of 1992 by Cambridge Seven Associates of Cambridge, Massachusetts is a postmodern tribute to Sterling and Wilford's Anderson Hall edition and Pelly's Herring Hall. It frames vistas and repeats the siding and compositional pattern of its neighbors. Uh, the tree screen here uh, doesn't enable you to see the front of the, the chemistry building by Watkin, uh, but this sort of practice of making these shaped gables that step down toward the street uh, is extrapolated from Watkin's building. Uh, and of course, as you see, it frames the vista of Hammond Hall, part of that Pierce Pierce uh, group of the 1950s uh, because it, it makes this archway over one of the cross axes as the building shape in Cram's general plan of 1910 uh, was shown as doing. The two European architects who designed buildings at Rice in the 1990s seem much less concerned about relating to buildings that were, after all, only 80 years old. Ricardo Bofil of Barcelona designer of Alice Pratt Brown Hall of 1991, clearly responded to the scale of the landscape and the desire of Michael Hammond, Dean of the Shepherd School of Music, for a big building. John Utram of London, architect for Duncan Hall of 1996, sought to construct what he described as a mythic landscape and was clearly emboldened by Cram's ornamental exuberance and stylistic eccentricity. American architects tend to be much more respectful. Hammond, Beebe, and Bobka of Chicago, in their design of James A. Baker III Hall of 1997, produced an exterior design that might well have come from the drafting tables of Cram's firm in the 1930s. The Washington, D.C. architect, Alan Greenberg, in his Humanities Building of 2000, likewise seems to have designed a, a neo-1920s classroom building. Greenberg shaped the humanities building to the peculiarities of its site, behind Razor Hall and alongside the Fondren Library. The uh, vaulted passageway preserves the pedestrian connection between the Fondren Library and Baker College, while the courtyard beneath the Pittman Tower takes advantage of the conjunction of cloisters and oak trees to make an outdoor room accommodating planned events as well as casual occupation. What is troubling about these recent buildings is that they construct Rice as a place of nostalgic prettiness, disengaged from the realities of modern life and construction technology. There are alternative Rice architectures and spaces. Embodied in Rice Stadium of 1950 by Lloyd and Morgan and Milton McGinty, and the Art Barn and Media Center of 1969 to 71, designed for Dominique and John Demenil by Howard Barnstone and Eugene Aubrey. Rice likewise possesses undesigned spaces, such as the service road behind the mechanical laboratory and Hammond Hall, which have never been integrated with the ceremonial spaces of the general plan. The potential these Rice architectural and spatial alternatives contain for expanding the limits of Rice's present consensus on what is and is not appropriate is demonstrated by the Tin House Movement. The most distinctive body of architecture to be produced in Houston in the 1990s derives from the metal-surfaced, shed-like art barn and media center. This is one of a series of these uh, metal surfaced houses in the Houston neighborhood of West End, uh, designed by uh, Natalie Appel, uh, a Rice alumna, and the uh, wife of the director of the School of Architecture here at Rice, John Kasbarian. Not all Rice buildings of the 1950s grew out of this neo-traditional paradigm. Antoine Predoc, uh, an Albuquerque architect, designed Butcher Hall of 1997. He exchanged the contextual approach of postmodernism for a site specificity that explores new ways to expand on the architectural and spatial practices of the campus. Butcher Hall figures in the landscape not as an independent exclamation point, but as a spatial anchor at one edge of the campus, and I think that's especially clear as you view it from Rice Stadium. It quotes other Rice architecture spatially rather than stylistically, as in the internalization of Rice Stadium in its elevated amphitheater, 
Butcher Hall makes connection to the buildings around it, such as the Space Science Building, and makes new spaces out of these connections. Predoc acknowledges reality and distills it. The interior courtyard that, represent, uh, that results from Butcher Hall's thin floor plate emphasizes the flatness and heat of Houston. At the new Wise College, under construction in 2001, uh, just to the west of Hanson College, the Boston architects, Rodolfo Machado and Jorge Silvetti, extrapolate from existing conditions. Like Butcher Hall, the new Wise features a roof terrace, and that's what you see here, these steps leading up to this terrace with the canopies on it. This spatially connects the residential group to playing fields alongside the Rice Gymnasium. Machado and Silvetti and Antoine Predoc construct new kinds of spaces by making connections to existing campus places. They continue Cram's practice of constructing continuity and demonstrate that new buildings can maintain tradition while exploring innovation. As Rice enters its second century, the challenge that confronts the campus will be to preserve and sensitively extend Cram's extraordinary spatial armature. Rice needs to plan for the conservation of its buildings, reusing existing buildings as it is tended to do, uh, the rehabilitation of the chemistry building as Keck Hall, uh, completed last year, uh, is an ex excellent example of this trend, and to acknowledge the exceptional cultural significance of the campus by having it listed in the National Register of Historic Places. Rice should critically confront the prevailing social construction of Cram's buildings as historical and traditional. They are bold, imaginative, and unprecedented. The purpose of such social construction is to legitimize the design of new buildings in ye olde styles. Uh, this practice would not be acceptable in any academic department in a research university. Uh, it should be equally unacceptable in its building program. The diffusion of architecture at Rice through time and across distance is a profound indication of the way that Edgar O'Dell Lovitz and Ralph Adams Cram's social and spatial construction of Rice as a great university has impressed itself upon the imagination of succeeding generations. Architecture at Rice is a spatial repository of the university's high emprise, its sense of its own distinctiveness, and of its obligation to maintain the high standards and ambitions with which it was begun. May it continue to be observed that as in President Lovett's time, when Rice builds, the world takes notice. Thank you. Are there any uh, questions or observations? Y yes, the university has spent several years grappling with what to do about the Fondren Library, and they finally came to the only reasonable conclusion, which is to scrape it. Uh, they have hired a very brilliant London architect, Michael Wilford, uh, the partner of James Sterling, uh, and I talked about their additions to Anderson Hall, the architecture building of 20 years ago. Uh, Michael Wilford, in his kind of initial proposal, has proposed a new building on the side of the Fondren Library uh, that will basically be two bars side by side, and then there will be kind of bridge over the center so that between them it will preserve the ability to walk uh, in the open air uh, underneath this bridge from the academic court, uh, sort of in front of the present Fondren Library, to the great square uh, behind the present Fondren Library between Herring Hall and the Rice Memorial Center. My, my fear for the putting the library there is that uh, every, every 20 to 25 years, the library needs to be doubled in size. And so, although you can design a building that for the time being seems to work well with the landscape, what happens when it needs to be four times as big uh, 
as it will be within 50 years if, if the future history repeats the past. Um, for that reason, I, I kind of wish that the Rice officials had explored other alternatives about where to put the library and look at the possibility of, of restoring Cram's vision to reopen the Great Square. Uh, I think the consensus was that because the centrality of the libraries and institutions seemed so important uh, that they would go ahead and rebuild there. Uh, my uh, kind of, you know, as told you, uh, I told you so prediction is though that it, it will continue to repeat the problems of the Fondren Library as the building needs to grow over time. So I think that they, they did a great thing in hiring a great architect and in getting rid of, of a building that uh, is, is manifestly inadequate. But I'm afraid they're kind of building back the same sort of problem. Do you think it's innovative? <clears throat> well, I, I've only seen photographs of the model. So I'm uh, really going more on my, my real trust in uh, Michael Wilford's skill uh, to, to assume that it will be indeed. Well, thank you very much.